So I'm Dave Cousins, and uh, I will uh, briefly introduce myself. Um, so I'm the uh, director of Duality Labs. That's the uh, portion of Duality that actually works with uh, government-sponsored and private-sponsored research and development. Um, I've been working with Kurt since uh, the the very beginnings of the uh, of the Palisade uh, development. I'm one of the uh, original authors of Palisade. Actually, Kurt and I go back further than that to the original uh, Proceed program, where essentially I uh, led the development of the first hardware uh, implementations of uh, homomorphic encryption schemes uh, on FPGAs. Um, so my background is uh, much more into applied R&D than in cryptography. And so I'm used to making computers do difficult, if not impossible things. And so that's why it's uh, last cryptography was natural. Um, so my talk today is going to be on the um, Boolean arithmetic applications of, uh, of Palisade. And we're going to move on. So a very brief um, overview uh, review of Boolean algebra and logic and circuits in general. Uh, then some basic examples uh, from Palisade uh, in C++ code. And you'll be able to go in and actually um, look at these, run them. You can play with them as much as you want. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at some simple circuits uh, using something that we just built called the Palisade Encrypted Circuit Emulator. And we've just released this as a, uh, a, a repository uh, in the Palisade uh, ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's brand new. Uh, it's, it's full of warts, and we invite you to go in and you know, feel free to uh, add to it. Um, and please don't tell me how good or bad it's written because, you know, it's uh, uh, like everything, we're, we're trying to do many things at once. And uh, we felt it was really just important to get this out to the community so that they could start working with um, Palisade as the back end for some fairly interesting applications. And then finally, I'm going to give you some additional circuit examples from the uh, encrypted research community that we, we actually got running on the simulator. So a quick, a quick refresher of Boolean logic, probably one slide. Um, you know, Boolean logic is taught in, in almost every electrical engineering computer science uh, curriculum. Um, we've all been associated with it. Um, basically, it's the basis of all digital logic. And the thing I want to get across is that there's many equivalent representations. We have circuits of gates. Um, I am going to try to find my pointer here and turn it on for us. There we go. So we have we have circuits of gates, for example, we have the NOT gate, the AND gate, the OR, the XOR. Uh, other gates are built from combinations of these, such as uh, negating the output of an AND is a NAND, same thing with a NOR. Um, we have gates which have one input is negated and the other one isn't, but they all are built fundamentally on um, a small number of, of gates. We have the circuit representation. Uh, EE guys are familiar with this. Uh, we have, for example, in like C code, you're familiar with the Boolean operations. And we can also express things as uh, truth tables, where what we do is we list the inputs, we list the output, and we list the output as all combinations of the inputs. So this is an XOR where basically the output is one if X or Y, but not both are, are uh, X or Y are basically not e equal. Um, the key thing about this is that these are all equivalent and that any logic circuit can be manipulated into many different forms. So you can manipulate a logic circuit to minimize the number of overall gates. You can manipulate it to try to minimize the depth, meaning the largest chain of gates that any single path takes from input to output. Or you can manipulate them to use particular gate types. and many circuits that you'll see that come from the um, crypto community uh, for example using used to drive something called garbled circuits uh, really have a propensity to choose one gate over another because that gate cost may be much lower okay 
moving on, representing systems of logic gates, we have many different ways of doing that. For example, circuit diagrams and schematics, one of the oldest ways of doing it. We have gates and wires, and um, that that is used by many developers. Uh, we have net lists, which, uh, of which they tend not to be very readable. What they do is they basically have a line for every entity in the circuit and then a list of the connecting wires that go to, to the other ones. And, you know, they're, they're basically used by uh, design systems as a way of transferring a circuit from one to the other. And uh, Blif is one, EDL is one, Bristol Format is one that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit um, that came from the crypto community. Uh, then we have hardware design languages, and you can build entire systems. You can build an entire CPU in a hardware design language, much like um, you know the modern structured languages that we have now. You you have everything where you can describe a small part of the circuit and then encapsulate that and use that as a, a component in a larger circuit, etc. Um, and then we have other ways of doing it. And for example, Palisade directly lets you connect gates together using C++ calls. This is good for simple systems, okay? It may be ter totally adequate for what you need to do. Um, and then this encrypted circuit emulator, which I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about, lets you script your own circuits and reads in some common netlist formats. And this is good for circuits with thousands of gates. And some of the circuits that I will um, show you that you can go to the repo, download it, and run. We have circuits there with, with tens of thousands of gates. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, uh, I don't see any. Uh, no open questions. Okay. So then I'm going to give you some basic examples from the Palisade distribution. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cost of encrypted logic. Um, so from a memory point of view, Palisade uh, can uh, be set to build a 32-bit or a 64-bit version of, of these, these uh, binary uh, um, schemes. We have, for example, there are two classic modes that we are able to implement with simply a, uh, a change in, in one of the parameters. So we have the classic, classical FHEW, which we call AP, and for, say, the standard 128-bit security, we'll find our bootstrapping key is on the order of 1.1 gigabytes. Key switching key is 300 megabytes. Uh, for, for Jinx, which is the TFHE approach, uh, for the same security, uh, we have a smaller bootstrapping key, only 64 megabytes, key switching key, 300 megabytes. For, you know, a, a server, these are not issues. But if you wanted to implement the, this code on, say, um, a much smaller processor, you know, these may become very important to you. The parameter of key switching size can be reduced if you desire, because it's a controllable parameter. But I'm not going to get into the details of that at this point. And every time we encrypt a bit, it takes two kilobytes of storage. Um, so one bit translates into two kilobytes. And that's the ciphertext expansion of, of using this homomorphic encryption technique. Okay. From the point of view of execution time, um, when we execute these gates, a knot is very fast, since no bootstrapping needs to be performed to do a knot. Okay, whereas when you execute ands and ors, one bootstrap has to be performed. And the timings that we see here are 107 milliseconds per thread for the AP and 143 milliseconds per thread for Jinx. So bootstrapping is, takes a little bit longer on that. The key thing about these, um, both of these techniques is that they are fully homomorphic. You have a bootstrapping operation done after basically every gate that needs it. So you have no limit to the depth of the circuit that you can perform. And that's why this particular approach is very powerful. Okay. For XOR, which uh, you saw before, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in general, it's, there's two approaches you can use. 
One of them is the, the standard XOR. It's three times slower than an AND because it uses three bootstraps. Now, you had seen Yuri speak about uh, when you have a problem with encryption uh, and you perform operations, if you perform too many operations, you basically can't decrypt. Well, in actuality, what you've got is a probability of correct encryption, probability of correct de decryption, I should say. And that probability is fairly low. But when you're talking about circuits with tens of thousands of gates, you will actually see these failures if you set that to be too low. So um, our standard that we use is a, is a probability less than 1 in 2 to the minus 32. And so um, that's what the standard XOR is. We have a, a faster version, which takes the same speed as an AND or an OR gate, but it has a, a higher failure probability, like um, to 2 to the minus 15. And so um, it, it can be a trade-off if you have something where you um, don't mind having a, a slight chance of having uh, the wrong answer, um, but speed is important, you can use XOR fast. Otherwise, we would suggest you use XOR. And if you can organize your circuits such that it, you are reducing XORs for, as opposed to ANDs and ORs, that would be beneficial. Um, there is a, a, um, a write-up on this, and uh, there's a link there. We will be posting all of these uh, slides uh, online, so you'll be able to follow them yourself. The key thing is the execution time of an encrypted circuit is strictly a function of the gate time. Okay? Manipulating the circuits to minimize that number of gates, not including the knots, right, will give you the fastest runtime. So I'm going to give you some C++ examples that are provided in the, in the Palisade release. And so you can find the sample executables when, when you build them, and you can find the C source code, and these are the, the paths to there. And there are a few examples. They're not very elaborate. Um, they really are just to, to get you started. The first one is Boolean. Um, it's called Boolean, and it's a simple collection of gates. And we'll actually talk about this uh, in some more detail. Uh, there is an AP version, uh, which is the same thing, except instead of Ginks, it uses AP. So you could run both of these, and you could directly compare the timing. Then we have um, a little bit more complicated one, where we show the basic gate output for all input combinations for all the, all the gates that we support. So basically, we're building truth tables. Um, and then finally, we have a pair of J, uh, serialized uh, outputs. Um, serialization is when you can save to disk the components of a uh, BinFHC crypto system. For example, the various keys in ciphertext. So it's the basis for being able to build a system where you have to actually pass data from, from one machine to another or from one program to another. We have a, a JSON version, which is human readable. Um, for what it's worth, they're just very large numbers of numbers. Uh, and then we have a binary version, which is much smaller file size. Um, the source code for, for sample benchmarks are also found in our benchmark directory. We, we have a uh, kind of a standardized benchmark framework. Uh, which we use for monitoring the performance of our system over, over its evolution, right? Uh, and uh, in, the, in this directory, there's, uh, I believe, two bin FHE um, prefixed uh, files. You can go in and look at those as well. So now what I'm going to do is, is look at the uh, boolean.cpp file. And I'm going to basically talk about the file itself. And then I'm going to show you the equivalent circuit representation and really kind of show how they map. So if you look at the equivalent circuit representation, if I was, you know, a, um, an electrical engineering oriented person and circuit oriented person, I would be drawing one of these, right? If I was a software person, I would be drawing one of these. If I was in VHDL, I would be doing somewhere in the middle. But um, essentially, each wire is a ciphertext, each wire that connects gates. Each gate is a function call, okay? And inputs are encrypted, and the outputs are decrypted. And a ciphertext can be used to feed more than one gate. We call that fan out. So in this example here, this, this ciphertext is fed to two gates. This ciphertext is fed to two gates, okay? If you look at the code, we have 
I have I've really st streamlined this down for the presentation, but you really only have to include one include file, and that is to get the binfhe context loaded, and then um, the namespace of LB Crypto, which is the standard namespace for Palisade. We have basically five steps. The first step is to set up the context, and that really only takes two calls. Uh, we use the auto uh, type for simplifying a lot of this code, because C++ um, modern versions, the compiler can infer what type you want based on the output uh, that, that's associated with this function. So that, that cleans up a lot of code. So you basically call to make the context, and then you use that context to set up the um, level of security. In this case, STD-128, the 128 bits of security, and we're going to use the AP version, okay? Um, you could use Jinx there. There's a bunch of different uh, security parameters that we have. Um, they are in the code. You can see them. We have a toy version, which you never want to use for anything secure, but it runs very fast. So you can use that for verifying that your code is correct and then change the parameter to, to something more secure. The next step is key generation. And we have to generate the secret key, and we have to use that to generate the bootstrapping keys. And this can take a little bit of time, but um, it's usually done only once in, in a program. Um, the next step is to encrypt the inputs. Um, it's a very straightforward call. This one is the value that you're encrypting. If it was a zero, you'd be encrypting a Boolean false. And the ciphertexts are now that um, um, expanded uh, data structure I told you about. Um, and those correspond to these wires. Your evaluation is you're actually now going to gate by gate by gate, you're going to evaluate the, the circuit. So four lines, four gates. We have two types of, of, of functions. We have um, eval bin gate, which takes two inputs, and we have eval not, which takes one input. And that's why it's, it's, a, it's a different shape. Eval bin gate, you give the name of the gate, and you give the ciphertext that drive it, and you get the ciphertext that's the result. And you're basically stitching these together like you would in, in, in any kind of hardware design language, or even, you know, it's, it's just basic, uh, basic code by that point. When you have a result, which is uh, this, uh, the output of this last gate, you know, you have to decrypt it. So LWE plain text is actually, um, in this case, I'm going to give you an unsigned integer, a zero or a one. And the decrypt call basically allows you to translate this from encrypted to decrypted code. Okay. So um, we have a couple of C code files that you can look at that have this kind of representation. Any questions here at this point? Okay. Uh, I don't um, see any open questions. Nope, no questions. We'll move on to some simple circuit examples. And so this is using the uh, encrypted circuit emulation repository. Um, a word about the encrypted circuit emulator. Okay, here's the Git repo. Um, there are build instructions in there. Um, it requires you to install Palisade on your machine. And then, um, in, and then uh, when you un unpack this repo, uh, it should it should link in. So this is really a front end um, for for Palisade. Palisade is providing the uh, the the um, the encryption and using the bin FHE um, modules. I do have a, a question comes up, but I will maybe hold that. Um, it contains C plus plus code. I would call it prototype code. Um, and what it does is it parses circuit representation input files. It will analyze and assemble them into an intermediate form for circuit emulation, okay, in a form of a dot out file. And then it runs C++ text fixtures to generate input and test the output for various circuits. It will execute the resulting logic circuit in plain text and encrypted form. It uses OpenMP, which is the standard approach we use in Palisade to uh, parallelize and it will evaluate the encrypted gates in parallel on all the available threads on your machine. You can control that if you want, but it's a it's a way of speeding up um, the execution. Uh, it also stores the minimum number of circuits, ciphertexts, um, 
again, this is most important if you're in a resource uh, uh, constrained computing environment where you have to worry about memory. Um, so what it does is it will dynamically allocate uh, the ciphertext for nodes as as the output is created, but once all gates that have fired that are fed by that node, that node is ciphertext is then deleted. Okay. So more about the circuit emulator, we have some limitations. Right now we're limited to Bristol format circuits. These are uh, a set of circuits that are um, that were developed a few years ago and they're used in uh, a lot of uh, multi-party communication, garbled circuit and some FHE uh, research. They're just um, circuits of convenience that we, we happen to work with before. Um, as, as a result, they, they have a limited number of I.O., limited number of gate types, and they tend to prefer XO over XOR over all other gates simply because in garbled circuits, XORs have extremely low cost. And so they're not the smallest circuits possible, but they're a good representation. Um, the intermediate format we generate is a bit primitive and fiddly, but you can actually use it to write your own circuits. And I'll show you two examples that I had built in order to, to demonstrate that. And then the circuits management and scheduling code that is done is, is very brute force. Um, its main goal is to be able to execute as many encrypted gates in, as possible in parallel and, and also to minimize the circuit, circuit ciphertext storage requirements. So overhead is very high for small circuits, but on large circuits, it's really negligible because the encrypted gate execution time, um, it, 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 it overwhelms the computation that is needed to be done. So we have some planned extensions where we're going to add um, uh, the latest version of Bristol format, improve IO definitions to allow some more complex circuits, and also optimize some of the circuit management and net lists. Uh, we also plan to follow improvements in Palisade performance as they get released. And there are several in the, in the pipeline that we're thinking about because um, this whole area is a very, very recent um, area of, of research and performance uh, improvements are, are coming in fairly quickly. So I'm going to give you some example circuits. Um, maybe we might want to see, no, no questions right now, um, but uh, I'll, I'll have a spot for it later. So we've built two simple circuits um, that we provide in the distribution. Uh, and this is where they're located in the distribution. Um, they're hand assembled, and the goal was to demonstrate the capability with a minimal runtime. So one of them is a, a two-bit adder, which is takes uh, two two-bit inputs, so four inputs total, four bits total, and generates um, the sum, the sum, and a carry. Right. So that's a three-put, that's three-bit output. Uh, the next one is an eight-bit parity generator and checker. Okay. Um, so I'm going to review the process of building these by hand. Okay. So this is our circuit for a two-bit adder. We've got basically registers A and B. The output is Q and C. Zero is the carry out. So these are the zeroth bit for the two registers. This is the the oneth bit. Okay. Very simple circuit. Uh, so you start with the basic circuit. Label the nodes. Um, so right now in this format, the nodes have to be labeled with R and a number. Uh, it's really a uh, it's really a carryover from from an, they stand for register. Um, so you just go through, you number them all. Um, they need to start at zero, but they can actually be in any order. Then you label the inputs, okay, and the outputs. And there's a labeling uh, which is spelled out here. There can only be one or two inputs. That's a restriction um, that arose from the basic uh, Bristol circuit format. And there can only be one output register. Um, but we expect to lift these in future uh, revisions. So now you have these labeled inputs, outputs. We have these uh, registers labeled. And you write them out like you're writing assembly code. Um, so the key thing is the first three lines uh, have to list the number of inputs, uh, bits, or the number of output bits. And then after that, um, we have here a load is, is a command that actually indicates that the input gets encrypted. And a store at the output here shows you 
your output is decrypted and these R numbers are those registers and it's just XOR and and not is in there if you need it. Um, again, very primitive kind of uh, intermediate format. You run it, this is what you would get. Um, I'm highlighting some of the some of the details here. All right, you run this program, it's called capital TB underscore adder to bit. And um, there are several command line parameters. You just type help and you'll see what they are. Um, it will list the number of inputs and outputs. Uh, it will tell you the number of intermediate uh, registers that had to be used, um, tell you the security and the, and the method that you're using, um, and then goes through several iterations. This was set up for 10 iterations. I'm just showing one. It will generate random inputs, compute the correct output, execute the circuit in plain text, um, and this is the same module, by the way, is you, you basically builds a, a, a class for the circuit. You tell it to execute in plain text, and it does it. You tell it to execute in uh, encrypted form, and it will do it. So it takes one millisecond for it to execute um, in plain text, and then it'll also just for verification tell you if you want the number of gates, and it tells you how many inputs, how many outputs, uh, you see we had three ands, one OR, and three XORs. And then it will also uh, tell you the execution time. So you can see um, one millisecond for plain text, 2,113 milliseconds for uh, encrypted. And this was done on a, uh, I believe this was a 12-core a machine. Um, and the efficiency is just what percentage of time was spent managing the circuit. Uh, what's, what percentage of time was spent actually running the encrypted gates versus the overall time. So in it, you can see that's really what, what dominates. The program then, you know, verifies the output. And so we have several of these. The next one I'm going to show you is a parity generator. I won't go into as much detail. The nice thing about this uh, um, example is that it uses the same circuit for two different purposes. So here's your standard parity generator which will give an, give an eight bits of input and uh, a ninth bit, which you can set to zero for a generator or you can use to cascade multiple uh, circuits together in order to make wider word parity uh, generators. And it will give you either a, um, a flag for even or odd, depending on the number of, of bits that were in the input, whether it was an even number or odd number of bits. Um, this is the code. Um, again, I'm not going to go over all the details, but very straightforward to do it in a matter of a few minutes. Um, the way it's used in, in the demonstration code, the, it actually is used twice. It uses the same circuit as both a parity generator and as a parity checker. Um, so this will show you in the code how you can build the circuit once, go through the overhead of building it once and then use it multiple times for different forms. So what happens here, you put in your, your eight bits of data, um, you take the even bit, uh, the even output, and then concatenate that as the ninth bit. So what happens here is if this word is even, even is one, you concatenate that, you now have odd parity, okay? And then if you take these nine bits and you feed it into the same circuit, you can do a parity check, which is showing you that in this case, if odd is not, if odd is not high, then we have an error. So a very simple example, but if you think about it, what you're doing is you, you, you can now check the, the parity of these bits and determine, you know, was there, you know, was there an upset somewhere in the system here uh, without decrypting the bits themselves. So it's kind of a, a nice, a nice example of, of an application that's, that's not a simple numeric application. Um, this is the output, really, the only thing that's important to show is, this, is that this executes in uh, 3,648 milliseconds, okay? Um, I want to just kind of sum up with some additional complex circuit examples. These are examples that we uh, have taken from the, uh, the, the Bristol circuits, this is, this is the, uh, the link to, to where they came from. There are several arithmetic circuits and there are several crypto circuits. Um, 
this is the name of the file that we use to uh, kind of con concatenate them all together and test them. These are our test benches for adders, multipliers, comparators. As Yuri said, um, this is a very powerful technique for doing comparison, uh, encrypted comparison. It's something that is not very easy to do in uh, some of the other schemes. And comparators are, are fairly lightweight. 32-bit uh, comparator has 150 um, AND gates. NOT gates, as I said, are almost, almost zero time. So you can do this comparison in 150 times approximately um, uh, what is it, a uh, hundred and some odd um, milliseconds. So, you know, this uh, on one, on one thread would, would be a second and a half. On 15 threads, it would be a tenth of a second. So, you know, there's, um, these, these are relatively lightweight. The crypto circuits are very interesting because they have very, can have a very large number of gates, uh, well over, well over uh, 10,000. So, um, it's uh, kind of, this is the stress test that we use to make sure that our code in Palisade runs correctly. We have verified that all of these gates, uh, all of these have, um, have run correctly. Um, they, they are there for you to run. Um, these will take a, a fairly long time to run because as I said, if they're, if they're well over 10,000 gates, it's the runtime is directly related to the number of gates and the number of threads. Um, this is the end of my presentation, and so we can have some uh, more, um, whoops, I'm sorry here, my, there we go. I'd like to thank you for listening, and we can take some questions now. So the yeah. question is, first question I see is, why do we need a parity checker? Um, well, a parity checker is, uh, is, is something that, you know, is taken from communications. Um, it is an interesting circuit, it is an interesting application. Um, I am not begging the application by saying I have to find one which does parity checking, but what parity checking does let you do is, is say, for example, you were looking at um, data that came in and there was a chance of it being corrupted. Um, it might be difficult to determine whether your encrypted data was corrupted. Um, and uh, the thing about this is that uh, parity checking is a standard way in communications and other circuits to look for a one bit error, a single bit error. One can extend this uh, into being able to detect uh, multi-bit errors or even correct a single bit error. Um, it's uh, pretty standard. You can, you can look up uh, uh, that, that math. It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, but yeah. it is really just presented here as kind of a, a, um, what we think is a neat example of what you can do. Next, are the, uh, we have here, uh, are there any sublinear search algorithms for private information retrieval on modular arithmetic? Well, that's not really what I would call a Boolean type problem. Um, yeah, do we want so, to address that? Yeah, so maybe Dave, since we're going to cover integer arithmetic in the next episode, uh, you know, I'll basically in, the, in that talk, uh, I'll try to at least uh, uh, give some guidelines in that direction, but I mean, but I think it's more for the next uh, episode. Okay, uh, I think that would be terrific. And finally, we have how long does AES computation take? Well, I'm going to preface this with that this is an AES circuit uh, that is doing everything with Boolean values. So, if you are concerned about speed, you would not do AES this way. Okay, this is really um, a AES computation has been done in this community using um, uh, other 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 uh, encodings and other schemes. Um, Yuri may want to ad address that. Um, so there are much faster ways of doing it, but this particular AES computation, I believe, took on the order of about 45 minutes on on my multi-core machine. Uh, the key thing is it's doing a very large number of um, of bit manipulations and the answer was verified. So, you know, that it's really the, it's really a very large integration test for us. Yeah, so maybe they all had a comment. So previ previously there was a, a monumental work uh, uh, so, uh, done by the HLE uh, team uh, on AES uh, uh, relation in uh, basically using BGV. But uh, something to note, uh, 
while the runtime that was reported there was a little bit less, I, mean, I don't remember something like, uh, I don't know, eight, I mean, maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, I, I don't recall right now uh, the numbers, but it was a highly optimized solution that required, uh, that had a lot of encoding challenges that had basically uh, involved a lot of non-trivial algebra to get it working and encode. And in this particular case, uh, we directly apply essentially the AS circuit uh, to encrypted Boolean values. So if we look from the perspective of usability, uh, uh, I, I think conceptually this approach might be very, I mean, quite interesting because it's much, you know, you can easily compile something, you can easily use it. So that that's something that I would like to point out. And of course, uh, uh, we have not put much effort in optimizing this. So we kind of went with a basic, uh, uh, you know, design, design choices. Uh, uh, based on the current implementation of uh, 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 PUNT FEG in Thousand. Great. So that's, that's, you know, I think probably uh, a number of ways of saying that, hey, this is uh, something that other folks have done before. We, we see it as a kind of a good target and it's still very much a work in progress. Yep. yep. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, and then the question, uh, well, actually, sublinear search algorithms for private information retrieval on modular arithmetic. This is, I think, more of a general one. Yuri, do you want to take this? This is probably like no, a deeper question. No, I think I already pointed out that we will. Oh, you did? Maybe I skipped it. Next, okay, yeah. In the next episode. Yeah. Yes, Yuri had, Yuri had already said that we're going to cover this in a later yep. session. So um, I thank you all. Um, if you um, get a chance to log, you know, get go look at the repo, kick the tires and uh, add to it. Um, uh, we think this is a very interesting uh, area of work where we're looking at some very practical um, capabilities uh, in the application domain. And we really would love to have as many people as possible take a look and use it. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, Erie and Dave, thank you very much for uh, the, the presentations. Um, for everyone that's still online, uh, we have been recording. We will uh, put it up on YouTube and have a link from the uh, webinar website in um, over the weekend. And then we will also start announcing the next webinar, which will basically be the last Friday of September also. Thank you, everyone. And Dave and Yuri, thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.